Good morning, Saints. Uh, thank you for joining me once again. Uh, let's dive straight in for our fourth session on Psalm chapter 3. So let's read. It's a psalm of David when he fled, that's the context, from Absalom his son. That's the context with which we're dealing. O Lord, how many are my foes, many arising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. That's our verse today. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people, Selah. Now, as we saw last time, uh, the context, or as we saw in the last sessions, the context for this verse in which we find ourselves is not just general suffering, but it's a very specific situation. And David is dealing with his son. His son is really making threats on his life, um, an attempt, a serious attempt at his life. He's stolen the kingdom. He's stolen his counsel. He's stolen um, the people, the hearts of the people. And so all of Israel really is out to try and kill David at this moment. And so David is in quite a, quite a pickle. Um, <laughs> he's in a sticky situation. And he's got a small battalion with him, but he's not really in any position to look after himself, all things considered. And so David is now not only fleeing for his life, but as we saw actually in verse 2, um, people are also saying there's no salvation for him. So they're also saying that God has forsaken him. And so we saw then that David um, rejects that claim and affirms, but you or God are the one who protects him. God is his shield. Um, and this is all true of God alone. God is his shield. God is his glory. And God is the lifter of his head. And therefore David can cry because of all of that. David can cry out to the Lord um, and something key that we didn't really focus on as much last time, but we should have really, is that God answers. David cries, God answers. Um, David is right in the thick of things. God answers from his throne, from his holy hill. God is above David's situation and therefore God is not phased by the situation David finds himself in. And so as out of after all of this, and we, and we get a sailor here, another, another pause for reflection. We've had one slightly earlier. Um, and so after all of this, after we've, we've, we've been, this has now laid the groundwork, we then get to this point where David is able to say these beautiful words that so often get quoted, but really outside of its original context, I lay, my, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. Now, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. When I, early on when I first got to the church that I'm at, a friend of mine told me, you know, because we're sinners, we always tend to one extreme or the other. And I find that's been so true when, whenever I think of any area of life, you know. Um, and in particularly for me right now, one thing I've really been thinking through a lot of is just the area of work. You know, for on one side, you know, you think of someone like Spurgeon Sermon, uh, The Slugger's Vineyard. And he's speaking on laziness and he's dealing with how people can be so lazy and how that's a really dangerous thing. But actually, you know, the other extreme, right, is trying to be a busybody always always having always trying to do something always 
working and never resting, right? And that's something I've been I've been wrestling through quite a lot recently. And you know, the sinfulness of laziness is neglecting the work we've been called to do, and it's to assume that God has no purpose for you and it's not redeeming the time. And so it's easy to think actually being busy is not as bad. But actually the problem here is you're assuming that God's not got everything under control and that the world can't continue without you and that if you stop the world stops and God's purposes can't be fulfilled apart from you you know it's you see at the heart of laziness we make little of God and remove him from his throne and idolize rest over his word but at the heart of overworking is a denial of our weakness idolatry of self and trying to occupy the role of God in thinking that we have things in our control by the power of our own hands right and so one of the things this verse really teaches us straight off the bat when David could have been really busy plotting scheming and trying to figure out how to um you know strategize and take out Absalom actually David's able to say I lay down and slept I woke again for God is keeping me the Lord sustained me and so one thing I want to really stress in this text is that we need to know that we have to trust in a God who is able to keep us. And in particular on that point, we have to trust in a God who works when we can't, right? And one who works all things together for our good. Um, and secondly, again, notice this. The next section, straight away, I will not be afraid. It's very easy for David to have been, become anxious at that point, right? To have started to wallow or to to be scared etc of what was going to happen next David doesn't do that either you know in the words of Spurgeon David's faith enabled him to lie down anxiety would certainly have kept him on tiptoe watching for an enemy you know it's this verse teaches us again that we have to learn to trust in a God who has all things under his control a God who is truly able to keep us, right? You know, and as we've already seen, right, even just again, building off the earlier sections, the things that we were seeing earlier on uh, with regards to the troubles that he's facing, etc. Suffering helps to correct our posture before God, right? It reminds us of our dependence on God. And so we have to pray through it. Right, So we saw that David cried, he cried aloud to God, he cried to God and God answers. Suffering brought David to that place. David as we saw as king um, with one of the largest thrones that we've ever seen. Um, David who is almost the, uh, the, the paradigmatic kind of king, the king that everyone points to when they think of an Old Testament king. David being that guy, you'd think that his glory... Um, would be one that would have him too um, high to, to, to ever bow down. But actually, no, this situation, God brings about, God is sovereign over it. God's sovereign hand is at work. God brings David down to this place so that his posture would be one of humility and complete and utter dependence on a God who is able to continue to work all things together for good even when David's uh, servants can no longer do it and David's army can no longer do it for him. When David no longer has the power in his own throne, David is brought to a throne much greater than his own, right? And so suffering again reminds us to trust in the sovereign power of God. And so we're seeing this. We're trusting in a God who works where we can't. We're trusting in a God who is gracious and able to keep us. We're trusting in a God we can come to in prayer and knowing that his sovereign hand is in complete control. Now, if you read the text, something you'll see is that David quite explicitly often looks for signs to see that God is still being merciful to him, that he's not lost favour with God, especially in light of the, um, the attacks that he's been getting on his soul, right? Where people are saying there's no more salvation for him in, in, in God. And people are saying because he's, um, especially Saul's family, 
They're saying because you have killed off our, um, of Saul and all of these people, you you have no you have no hope in God. And they're throwing stones and they're doing all of these things and they're and they're, and they're slandering him. And what you get left with is a David who's now actually wondering, does God really still care for me? All right. And so maybe he starts to say at some points, you know what? Ultimately, maybe if God keeps me through this pending war or this difficult time. But by the time that David wrote this, this psalm, this song of praise, it seems that David appreciates here that even the act that requires, dare I say, in one sense, the least amount of energy on our part is a testament to the kindness and sustaining power of God, right? Even the act of sleep is testament to the fact that God is being merciful, right? We have to trust in the consistent goodness of God. Let me build on that a bit more. You know, the scripture says that in him we live, move and have our being, right? And as long as we live, there is not a single time when it's not the power of God that is sustaining us. Even the most basic things that we presume upon, food, sleep, are all good and perfect gifts that come from above, right? And therefore, God is actually worthy to be praised. We have to trust in the consistent goodness of God and we have to praise him for it. It's actually the unbeliever who looks around and even though God is blessing him repeatedly, as it says in Romans 1, the unbeliever shows no thanks. That's one of the fundamental sins that differentiates between the believer and the unbeliever. But actually, the believer is one who appreciates that even in the... Even in sleeping and waking up, laying your head down and rising up again, you appreciate that it's God who gives his beloved rest, right? And so it's no hard thing. It's, by the way, and this is another point, it's no harder thing for God to keep this old, frail David through this storm than it is for him to give his beloved rest. It's not any harder for God to keep him through the night than it is for God to keep him through war. You know, actually, I think it was Jonathan Edwards or Abraham Kuyper, one of the two, um, would actually say that all of creation is so radically dependent on God's power to survive that it's not actually just the laws and substances, etc., and, and, and some rules and regulations that keep the world going, right? It's not that God has set things in motion, but... That same power that is used to speak the world into existence is continuously going forth and recreating all things repeatedly such that then there is not a single time where we're not living in that very creative power of God. God is consistently sustaining us in the most real sense. We don't lift an arm up apart from the sustaining power of a God Almighty alone. Not the laws of gravity that brings us down. It's God who allows us to fall and allows the sun to rise and allows the, uh, you know, the other the, of the constellations, etc. to move the way they do. It's only God who's in complete control of those things, who allows the, um, the earth to orbit around the sun, etc. You know, um, it's God's power. Who's, 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 who's doing all of these things. The sun doesn't continue to give light apart from God's active hand in it right and um, God's hand is actively at work within creation and so we have to trust in God's sustaining power right and finally let me just close with this David was able to lay his head down in faith trusting that God would keep him through the night but the thing is we can look at David and be encouraged you know and and, and stop there but that's not what we're called to do, right? David is not our ultimate source of comfort. David's story is encouraging, sure, but seeing many people go to sleep and not wake up or being in the midst of a pandemic and witnessing so many people dying, losing loved ones or us going through trials and sometimes not coming out on the other side. We've all lost and we've seen saints who have passed on into glory. And so we can look at David's story and... In one sense, as much as it might be an encouragement, it can't be sufficient to keep us. It can't be all we have to look to. 
But that's the thing. It's not, right? And we, and we know this. Because when we lay our heads down, we have the privilege of looking up to our Lord. You see, we can lay our heads down to sleep, looking at Christ who laid his head down in death. We can entrust our days to God, knowing that Christ overcame the darkest of nights. You see, irrespective of the hardest trials we face, we know that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we stand in absolute certainty that as surely as the Father loves the Son, as surely as God the Father loves God the Son, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Just to close, let me read the words of this hymn. Because I think it's so such an encouraging hymn to read at this particular moment and at this point in the text. But it says, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit and oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care. Precious Saviour, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he will, he will take and shield thee. And thou wilt find a solace there. Amen.